Previously on the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. What are we reading next month, Sean? Well, next month it's back to the Virgin New Adventures, and it's going to be a Mark Gatiss book. Hmm. Uh, it's going to be a book called St. Anthony's Fire, and it's got the Doctor and Betty, and that's all that I know about it. Interesting. I haven't heard anything bad or good about it, but we'll see. That's usually a bad sign. <laughs> And now, the conclusion. to the all-new adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. This is Matt in Minnesota. And Chris in South London. Chris, hello. It's August, and we're uh, back together again for another uh, exciting book. It's great. It's uh, it was also, it's been an interesting few weeks in the world of Doctor Who, uh, to sort of put it mildly. So hopefully by the time this has come out, things might have kind of settled down and calmed down a bit with reactions to um, to a certain announcement on the, on the casting front. Where were you when you found out the news? <laughs> funny it's a funny story so so for yeah. those who are wondering or who may be listening to this later we're talking about of course the casting of Jodie Whittaker as the yeah. 13th or 15th doctor depending on how you count <laughs> yeah. she's the first uh woman to play the part ever so this is uh huge news and it has been causing ripples across fandom I think a lot of people are excited some people may be more reserved or uh, in a few cases, perhaps uh, not excited. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, no, I, f- I found out the news. I was on a, I, you pr- probably don't have these in England. Have you ever heard of a pizza farm? No. Okay. So... <laughs> yeah, so I was... I'm intrigued. Go on. What's a pizza farm? About an hour south of the Twin Cities, there's a town called Northfield. It's south of the cities, but it's got north in the title. But uh, they're it's a thing where uh, farms will uh, install um, brick oven pizza ovens, I guess, and uh, invite the public to, you know, hang out at the farm and, you know, you see the horses and get out of the city and that sort of thing and all the animals and you can mm-hmm. uh, have a big piece of pizza while you do it. It's a very American uh, thing. <laughs> what? Never heard of that. Most of my experience of kind of like life in America has been the deep south where pizza farms not so much a thing. It's it's a relatively new thing. Um, oh, okay. But yeah. but I meant American in terms of, you know, in order to visit a farm, you need to have a slice of pizza in your hand, that sort of thing. I mean, are the ingredients kind of like from the farm? Yeah, yeah, locally sourced, yeah, yeah. Tomatoes and, uh, yeah. yes, and you might see the meat as you arrive, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. Just, I had uh, watched the video there, and uh, it was, uh, it was yeah, it was a very surreal, because it's, it's quite it was a lot more crowded than i thought it would be so it was like something like 100 or so 200 people you know all waiting in line for pizza at this farm it wasn't right. it was kind of a weird experience but um <laughs> <laughs> to say the least where were you when you found out the uh the news i was at a music festival uh so uh, i just finished watching mavis staples um of motem fame i'd also been sort of checking on twitter and sort of seeing that uh, the wimbledon match was wrapping up because um, people of the future this was announced immediately after the men's Wimbledon final so not a static time um, but (laughs) something that's kind of sports dependent uh, which would have meant that probably there were quite a lot of people watching them their tennis in the UK that uh, don't normally Uh, and uh, yeah I I found out whilst kind of sitting in the stands and uh, and was quite surprised and uh, then it was announced to the masses in um, at the festival 
uh, by um, Neil Hanlon of the Divine Comedy, who uh, I seem to recall has popped up on stuff as like a celebrity fan. Um, it was uh, at the start of the Divine Comedy set. He told people that uh, there was a female Doctor Who and he seemed to be greatly in favour. It's, you know, it's like most of the time I found out about it from watching TV or <laughs> reading press reports. Um, yeah, mm. it, was, it was quite strange kind of leaving the tent and kind of knowing that by the time I get back in the tent, I'll know who the new doctor is. Because there was one actor who was being touted whose name I yeah I didn't want to be hearing. And we didn't hear that name. So I was, I was very, very glad. Mm. Yeah, I was uh, I was excited, and uh, mm. it'll be interesting to see uh, where the show goes from here. I'm almost as intrigued with kind of where Chris Chibnall's going to take the show as I am, mm. uh, you know, in terms of having a, a female doctor. Because there's there's so many different ways you can play it, right? There's yeah. Ideally, I would think it would it would be no different than a male doctor taking the role, but you know, of course, there could be instances like we've seen with say you know bill or martha as a companion where mm -hmm. in history depending on the era you visit could introduce additional problems into a particular story um mm -hmm. you know from a narrative perspective but um i'm excited i haven't really seen yeah. any of her other work yet so i'm gonna seek some of that out and mm -hmm. I've, I've listened to a couple of different podcasts go over her kind of cv <laughs> mm, yeah yeah i've not seen much of her work i i have a confession to make I don't like Broadchurch. Uh, I saw a couple of episodes of it, and uh, so and I've seen. So I'd have seen her in that. Yeah, this is why I'm. I'm slightly nervous about Chibnall, but I've been told by various friends of mine that, um, regardless of the merits of Broadchurch, she is excellent. Uh, including, yeah, I've been told by friends of mine who didn't like Broadchurch. So uh, I, I'm. I am. More excited for her and what she represents mm -hmm. than, uh, than necessarily um, the uh, the guy who wrote Cyber Woman for Torchwood. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, hopefully he'll uh, prove us wrong and. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm very happy to prove him wrong, um, and uh, I, I, and I'm sure I, and I'm, I'm sure I'll be able to kind of find yeah sort of like in, in the modern series even in episodes that have very much not been to my taste I've been able to find something to enjoy, and so I'd rather watch Bad Doctor Who than um, than watch sort of mm. yeah lots of other stuff, which is why Time Lash is one of my favourite stories. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. Yes, yes, and th th there's there's the almost obligatory time mesh reference. Thanks. There we go. Right, we got it. We got it in early. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so apart from the big casting news, uh, mm. what do you have for us for show and tell? Right. So for show and tell, so I'm going to be staying at that music festival that I was speaking about earlier on that day. Uh, I'd seen Catherine Jenkins of uh, A Christmas Carol fame and General Opera. Sing, uh, sort of singing uh, at a lake, which is all very lovely, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. Okay. I, I was in a crowd watching um, Millie M Willie Mason, a, uh, a sort of an alt country sort of singer uh, who had a kind of a, a minor hit about ten years or so ago, and uh, it was all very lovely and jolly. And I noticed in front of me there was this bored kid who was kind of at his parents' feet reading. I then noticed that he was reading about Wotan and the Zabi. <laughs> <laughs> so it was this kid reading this Doctor Who sticker book. And uh, he was kind of like obviously at the far end of the alphabet. And, and he was just pouring over it. I mean, part of it might have been because he obviously wasn't as much of a fan of all country as the people around him. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I just thought, what a remarkable world it is uh, that, that you've got sort of kids, I mean, you know, say 10, 11 or so, um, reading about stuff that was on TV before their parents were born. Mm, mm -hmm. well before their parents were born um, and that possibly their grandparents would have seen as kids and uh, yeah and, and he did seem to be kind of like taking kind of enjoyment from it and, and yeah yeah I, I was always kind of getting a bit distracted by it so I kind of moved away to another bit of the crowd but uh, but yeah so I, I don't know whether I'm submitting um, sort of 
the ex yeah the excitement of seeing kind of young fans or whether I'm sort of submitting the um, the Doctor Who sticker book which did seem to have <laughs> a lot more text in it than I would have expected. Nice. Um, and Wotan, I wouldn't have thought would be the Doctor Who sticker book. That's a that's a deep cut. Mm. Uh, but uh, but yeah yeah that's, that's really cool. Sometimes I hear my uh, husband is a high school teacher, so I hear <laughs> stories sometimes about uh, kids who. Uh, are really big Doctor Who fans uh, at school, and it's interesting to kind of see how that's grown over the years, mm. um, especially in the States, I would say, somewhat with Tenet, but definitely when, you know, Matt Smith uh, came on board, there was uh, a big uptick in in interest, but that's that's always great to, to see that, as, and especially something so obscure, too, um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. as, as that. that. That's really cool. Speaking of uh, Doctor Who and the Zarbi... <laughs> Are they in the Christmas special? Everybody else seems to be in the Christmas special. <laughs> they could be. It's hard to say. Yes. Um, but no, uh, BBC Books just announced, I saw that uh, they're going to start doing audio adaptations of the stories from the annuals. Oh. So, yeah, so those are going to uh, come uh, in a collection this fall. I think the first six Doctors, which makes sense because I don't know that there were any. No, the annuals stopped. So the... Um, that were done by I think it was Fleetway Publishing or maybe wrong. Um, so they 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 stopped after the hiatus and then Marvel revived the tradition in the kind of mid ninety or early to mid nineties. Uh, so yeah, you won't see many short stories or any short stories of the Seventh Doctor in an annual form, mm-hmm. uh, unless yeah, from, from what I recall. But uh, yeah, and some of those short stories that were from the first six Doctors are of uh, variable quality uh, and uh, and variable familiarity of the show as well. <laughs> but but fascinating reads. Yeah. But, uh, yes. Yeah. Cool. Anyway, sorry. So for show and tell for myself, I've yes. I'm going to talk about my favorite piece of Doctor Who merchandise ever, mm. and this uh, I like it so much because it shouldn't exist. It's a uh, <laughs> it came out in 1997 and it was um it's a toy it's a um it's like a micro play set right similar to like uh i think it popular at the time there was like poly pocket and star trek inner space series by playmates and right micro machines okay. and okay. it's called uh doctor who in the domain of the daleks <laughs> <laughs> it came out so it came out in 97 so a year after the tv movie it's a miniature playset that features the Eighth Doctor frosted ice logo, which was only in use for a year. Yeah. It features the Fourth Doctor, <laughs> Davros as they appeared in Remembrance of the Daleks. Okay. It's just this kind of bizarre collection of little miniature toys that fit inside this uh, folding Dalek playset, okay. and it's uh, it, it's it's such a weird thing because it it really shouldn't exist. It it came oh. out you know after Daypole lost the license and before character options uh got the action figure license and it's just kind of this weird piece of uh merchandise from the uh wilderness years era that uh yeah it took me a while to track one down but i'm really glad that i i got one i've never heard of that if you google um yeah. like bluebird doctor who dalek right okay it should come up if you want to see a picture of it yeah i'll know. have a look that was shall we say optimistic uh for anybody to be putting oh Okay, yeah, I mean, look at it. So it, it's kind of, um, the Dalek is very kind of like Pertwee type colouring. Um, and the Dalek pops up and there's a TARDIS inside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow. Okay, wow. I've never, yeah, this, this is this is very much not cross my radar. So you've got, yeah, you've got Tom Baker doing some kind of squat uh, <laughs> and... Uh, with his with his scarf seemingly stuck to his trousers, yeah, and it doesn't. This photo might not be a very good quality photo, but it it doesn't look like it's the the closest model to him. Uh, yeah, that would be accurate, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, and Davros looks a bit of like a kind of a blob in the Emperor's sort of suit type thing that he had in Remembrance. Mm. But yeah, no, that, that yeah. Yeah, it's wow. a kind of a bizarre piece of merchandise. And I know like yeah. uh, Star Trek at the time had like fold out enterprises that were similar. So I wonder if it was trying to take advantage of whatever small market there was for that. But uh, yeah, but yeah, that, yeah, so that's my uh, cool okay show, I guess, for the month. Yeah, yeah. So this month we're going to be talking about St. Anthony's Fire by yes. Mark Gatiss. Now, I haven't heard of Mark before. What else, what else has he done? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> you jest, sir. You yes. jest. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, this was this was Mark's uh, second book. I think second book ever. Uh, certainly second book for uh, for Doctor Who. The difficult second album, as it were. Yes. Yes. We we we, we will see how accurate that is. Uh, and this was also um, after he wrote this, he didn't write for the current Doctor until he did um, uh, one of the audios, I think it was Invaders from Mars for uh, Paul McGann's Doctor for Big Finish. And uh, then it was the TV era. He's done quite a few TV scripts. Um, there does seem to be a kind of like a vocal section of fandom that doesn't care for his scripts, mm-hmm. from from what I see. Was I won't want to say that I can kind of defend all of them. I, mean, I didn't care for Robert, sorry, Robert of Sherwood, for example. However, I, mean, I, I do quite like some. I mean, I, I like Victory of the Daleks. I'm sorry. I enjoy Victory of the Daleks. Mm. Uh, and also quite liked as well um, uh, Sleep No More. I prefer Sleep No More to Heaven Sent. What? <laughs> I really do. I think Heaven Sent's uh, uh, sort of very much overhyped i think you just broke my brain but yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah my opinions not align with with, with most other people so uh... (laughs) well well yeah (laughs) i'm collecting my thoughts uh Wow. So yeah, I with with so with Mark Gatiss, I I've liked some of his work, um, some of it not as much. I would I really did not care for Sleep No More. Um, <laughs> I think I think a lot of fans uh, kind of share that opinion, as, as you said, yeah. kind of an outlier. Some of his work, though, I rather enjoyed The Crimson Horror, which mm. might be kind of out there as well. Um, I I liked uh, Cold War quite a bit yeah unquiet dead's an interesting one because while i enjoyed it at the time if you if you go back and really mm. look at like the doctor's motivations and how he essentially just kind of gives up in the cellar after uh it's, it's kind of a really dark story and and you could very much look at it as kind of uh the doctor uh taking his his whole ptsd to a, to another uh level and involving rose in it so it, it kind of has a weird take if, if you look at some of the doctor's motivations in that story but Idi- idiot's lantern i wasn't wasn't my favorite it was it was okay mm-hmm. there's definitely certain themes that come up again and again in his work mm. whether good or for bad there's there's te- there tends to be you know a very as is with this book um very male dominated cast oh yeah uh, we get we get that quite a bit yeah and then I, yeah. without getting too far ahead into into the book too it seems to have and and from what i've heard he's he has an entire room in his house that he's converted into like a victorian uh laboratory mm. and uh he has a fascination with like uh gas lamps so i think mm throughout this this book you get at least one reference in every chapter to the flickering of the gas lamps uh yes. which kind of calls back to uh or well calls forward to uh unquiet dead mm. which he mm. wrote um you know about a decade later mm. i think everyone's somewhat familiar with mark gatus he's he's <laughs> uh written for the show almost every yeah. season and he's appeared in it uh twice i think right as professor yeah. lazarus and as a viking and he will appear in it again yes oh that's right of course yes yes yeah so yeah and um, and also in this country as well he's quite famous for the league of gentlemen uh which was a tv series that he did with uh, reese shearsmith uh, amongst others which started appearing on our screens not long after um sort of st anthony's fire and so and so yeah well, I say not long, probably about three or four years, but yeah, it, it was kind of bubbling away. So yeah, I, I find it quite strange at a time that um, that one of these kind of big comedy stars was a guy who was writing, yeah, he had been writing Doctor Who books. So I like, oh, okay. I had met him at the uh, same Gallifrey in 2006 that uh, mm. Stephen Moffat was at. And my my one mm-hmm. memory of him is that he uh, did not care for the t shirt I was wearing. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, yeah, I had on a um, and at, I had on I think a Little Britain t shirt. Oh, okay. Which you know before long before it had kind of run its way into the ground. This is after maybe the first or second series had aired, where hey Tom Baker was narrating it, and there was a reference to Davros. So you know back in the wilderness years, that was 
huge for fans to yeah. even get a mention of the show on some of other property. And he had worked on, I think, the first series of Little Britain as a script editor, mm. but then he left after that. And I don't know if it was just scheduling or if, you know, if it was something to do with Crisis differences. Yeah, or, or whatever. But he, he looked at my shirt and he just kind of scoffed. <laughs> <laughs> so. No. I, I have a, um, a, a Mark Gatiss story that doesn't involve um, attire. When, when the 50th um, sort of anniversary year was, was in play, there was a, a screening of The Mind of Evil uh, at, the, um, at the BFI, the British Film Institute. And, and he was there amongst, um, along with Katie Manning and various other people that were kind of, uh, sort of involved in in, in the production of the program, and uh, there was a kind of a, a Q and A, uh, and and there was some there was one guy in the audience who was sort of um, saying to um, to sort of Tim Coombs, uh, that, oh, it, it, the scripts were so good in those days, unlike nowadays. Sorry, Mark, in a very passive aggressive way. I just felt a bit sorry for Mark Gatiss. Uh, but there, there was kind of like a little cafe thing there, and and I saw somebody go up to him with kind of like his family, I was like, oh, don't bother him. Just just leave him be. And I kind of thought, do I wander over and say something? And then I realised, oh, no, that's Mark Ayres. Yeah, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not going to go and, you know, I'm not going to steam in and just make an idiot of myself. So, uh, yeah, so I, 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 I saved myself from defending the two Marks from meeting each other. <laughs> <laughs> Probably just as well. Um, I can't imagine that would be well received by either party. Right. Um, shall we? Shall we begin with uh, Saint Anthony's Fire? Yes. And uh, so this book it has uh, twenty chapters, a prelude, and an epilogue, and then there was a prologue that was published uh, in Doctor Who magazine, right? Yes. Yes, it was. Um, which is. And most of that is is set uh, a few years before the main body of the action, uh, and and like most of the, because Doctor Who magazine at the time would on a regular basis have uh, some kind of writing from uh, that month's uh, new adventure, and and most of the time it it just didn't read well as a story, uh, or be a particularly effective hook into into the novel. Uh, and uh, I, I, I would say that uh, that this kind of is very much into that camp of uh, yeah, it's just it's 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 not essential. Mm-hmm. But uh, but yeah, so and that happens to be our dramatic reading for the month. Yeah, the um, the, the actual the prologue um, from the novel is a dramatic reading rather than the prelude. Oh yeah, sorry. Shall we have a listen? By the end of the night, Nerid knew she'd be dead. Her whole body shaking, she sank down on the grass, breath coming in rasping hiccoughs. Exhaustion flooded through her, like in a season, seeping into every bone, every aching sinew, forcing her heavy head down towards the pasture. Nerid's eyes clamped shut, and there was a brief period of luxurious, cool darkness. She listened for the sounds of the world around her. There was nothing. No wind, no voices. Not even the mournful cries of the bedhead, which normally wheeled and flocked in the winter sky. Nothing. She kept her eyes shut and ran both her hands down her body, feeling the wet sheen of her skin, as though for the first time. Almost over. There was a deep, startling rumble from the far horizon. Nerid's yellow eyes flicked open and she cocked her head to one side. Above, the sky was darkening, thickening. She leapt to her feet and took off across the pasture land, long toes digging deep into the ground. Something seemed to rush at her and she stumbled, knees ploughing into the soil. She gasped, winded and struggled for breath, willing air into her screaming lungs. Sniffing the air, Nerid's small, warty face wrinkled in disgust. It was coming. She could smell it. The thunderous boom came again. Rolling into one long, disquieting peal. Ahead, the forest stirred, as though unnerved. Spindly branches tearing at the air like the hands of ebony skeletons. Near it, bolted towards the only shelter she knew, clutching the spool in her sweat-soaked hands for dear life. So little time. 
All at once, Fisa was in front of her, waving his hands frantically and casting anxious glances at the darkening air. He was bellowing something, but Nero couldn't make it out. Behind him, the polygon shone dully, like a fragment of storm cloud ripped from the sky. Fisa was already halfway inside. Quickly! Run, Nero! Run! Run! Spit flew from between his teeth. Nero scrambled across the pasture her long arms scuffing at the earth as she struggled to maintain her pace. One glance over her shoulder at the sickly, liverish sky confirmed her worst fears. She choked back a tide of overwhelming panic. Blood roared in her ears. She didn't want to die, above all things, but Feeson said it was inevitable, and Feeson was never wrong. The small man flapped his hands in agitation, and grabbed Nerid by the scruff of the neck. She stumbled over the thresholds into the polygon and fell back against the padded walls. Feeson took the spool from her hand and rammed it into the black console by his feet. I'd all but given up, he said, his voice little more than a tiny, tight whisper. Nerid nodded wearily, her head dragging itself down onto her shuddering chest. She held out her hand and watched it tremble. There were tiny half moons of blood on her palms, where her nails had dug in. It would all have been for nothing she dropped the spool. Three low chimes sounded from the black console, and Feeson nodded slowly. It's done, he said, simply, holding out a hand for Nerid. She looked at him, and saw tears brimming in his sun-yellow eyes. The feel of his rough hand in hers was almost unbearably reassuring. Feeson pulled Nero to her feet and wrapped his long, thin arms around her. The room began to shake violently. Well, said Nero. Feeson smiled a small, sad smile, and together they stepped out of the polygon. When they were dead, when the last of Nero and Feeson's gluttonous blood had disappeared in the inconceivable darkness, the polygon slid silently below the ground, gently excavating a pit for itself and its secrets. All right, and that was the <laughs> that was the prologue. Hmm. Thank you for uh, recording that, Chris. No worries, no worries. And uh, I should have mentioned too that every chapter kind of has like a Hartnell style episode title, so you'll get chapters like "Attack from the Unknown." <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. So that was kind of cool. Uh, well, also probably worth mentioning that uh, that the that the characters that are uh, that you've just been hearing about, uh, Nerid and Fasoon, Fasoon, I pronounce it Fasoon, I think. We won't hear anything more of them until about three quarters of the way in. So it's the grand tradition of kind of opening scenes in a new adventures book that you're going to take a long time before you realize what it's got to do with the price of fish. <laughs> From a setting perspective, mm. uh, this takes place in 2148 AD. I think there's a single reference to the time period, although it's not really important because it doesn't, it takes place off earth and it's set somewhere, you know, near future is, is really mm. all you have to know about that. And then from the perspective of where it takes place in the Doctor, Benny, and Ace's uh, timeline. Mm -hmm. This would be after um, they, the three of them had been traveling together for a while, and mm -hmm. Ace had left for a period of about three years to go fight in the Dalek Wars, and she uh, is back and is part of the TARDIS crew uh, after mm -hmm. after that time. Yeah, and so we are, we're between the, um, the Doctor Who books First Frontier and Falls the Shadow. Does that really will necessarily mean too much to folk? And we're not in the middle of a story arc, so yay! Um... <laughs> oh, that's nice to have a standalone. <laughs> yes, yes. So the, the book opens with, mm. um, there are two groups fighting on a planet called Batrusha, or Petrucia. Yeah. There's there's going to be a lot of alien names, so there there may be multiple pronunciations. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. And the uh, the people of this planet are uh, lizard uh, like, I guess. So they're uh, bi bipedal, but they're um, kind of like Silurians or ice warriors or mm. Chelonians, if you uh, have read Gareth yeah. Roberts. Uh, w mm. the, although they're more like turtles. Um, but kind of reptiles, and they they've been fighting a civil war planet wide. Um, mm 
for about 15 years and it's gotten to the point go ahead you say you say it's a civil war so is it a civil war or a world war oh that's a good point uh because it because this is one of the things that patricia it doesn't feel like a terribly big place uh because i mean but anyway we'll, we'll, we'll kind of go into some of that uh but also go back to to kind of describing what these what, what creatures look like they were good at spending a lot of time and they are described at one point as as being kind of iguana like which is probably a good way to kind of picture them so like iguanas walking around in kind of tunics and uniforms they are on the cover too so they are and what a beautiful cover it is mm. um yes it's the grand tradition of new adventures cover where i was like oh well i guess that's a picture but actually unlike some of the covers it's a scene that we do actually see in the book so yay yep. uh, and, the, okay. and these two uh lizard like uh I guess you could call them races because part, mm. of, part of their uh, war against each other is ideological in, in like a like a race war where one group's mm. trying to purify the other and then there's uh, religious uh, things intermixed yeah. in there as well. So, so it's, it's uh, quite a conflict. So we don't we don't we don't go into too much of the religion of the other side. So we are going to basically see this from from one side. Mm. Uh, so. We fairly early on meet a, a lizard called Grek, who's leading a squadron in this kind of jungle-based conflict. Uh, and kind of going back again to the scale of this planet, it appears to be primarily a jungle planet. And the kind of like a Terry Nation school of planets must all have one type of habitat. Because uh, I don't remember much about any kind of like Arctic areas or anything. It does appear to be almost entirely jungle from what we see, at least. And really only three or four large cities on each side too so it's not yeah it's not terribly huge so maybe it's all happening on one continent or mm. in terms of techno technology too it, it is kind of set in that gatus favorite time period of, of victorian or edwardian era where you have uh mm. rifles and you have dirigibles and oh yeah <laughs> um in, in terms of the level of technology i think it's kind of at mm. like almost like a not quite a steampunk level yeah and also the um the conflict is best sort of as kind of like world war one mm. um uh so we have kind of like trench uh warfare uh and and kind of grek feels very much like a character from world war one literature you know, i was very much reminded of uh, the play journey's end which uh, there are certainly one or two kind of parallels to um in some of the early bits he reminded me a lot of uh, the brigadier, just in terms of mm. kind of his his attitude and outlook, and um, where he he wouldn't hesitate to kill someone if necessary, but you know if mm -hmm. if it was justified. But he was um, he respected honor and you know the chain of command and that sort of thing. And yeah, and Greg's been fighting this war for quite a long time. Um, I mean, he's got and there are some younger soldiers under him there's a guy called Pris who's sort of quite quite eager to impress but there there's also this general sense that his men know that he's weary of the war and there is a sense as well that the men feel that he's not the right leader for them uh, there's a guy called Lisso who we meet uh, fairly early on who's kind of got like a sort of you know, pristine uniform and he's he seems to be sort of regarding himself as like one for the future uh, so you've got a little bit of kind of jockeying for position. The other main character, I would say, is uh, mm. at least within that group. And the two sides, the the side we're talking about with Grek is called the Ismetch, and the other side is called the Kutch, or yes. kind of the two groups. Um, yeah. The other kind of main Ismetch character, I think, is uh, his name is Ran, and he has, yeah. he has like one eye, and he's kind of a mm. battle-weary soldier oh no i think rand's all the twitch lisso has got the one eye oh it's very right. it's very it's very hard to tell between the two characters that's right yeah so it's so, like because and so quite often when they appear so it's like oh rand's sort of twitching face like oh yeah it's that one because yeah because you you have precious young officer you also have a an elderly doctor um called makonza who um uh, is yeah uh, he, he's there as the kind of like the the, like the sage advice to Grek, because they both fought uh, in the Battle of Delarida Bridge, which pops up quite a bit in conversation. And doesn't that sound World War One? I? I mean, it, so basically, there's a World War One vibe going on. 
Uh, there's also a peace that's being uh, agreed uh, or on the brink of being agreed between Diaz Match and, 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 and the Kutch. Uh, and people are quite cynical about the peace and they're sort of saying, is it worth all of the deaths on, uh, on, on their sides? And whilst all that's going on as well, we, we kind of cut to uh, the capital city, which is a place called Porsim. And there we encounter uh, a kind of like a president type figure. Um, you'd have thought would be kind of hammering out the peace, but it turns out that the capital city has been devastated by unknown forces. And uh, and he thinks that sort of something has returned from the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we will start to hear a few little kind of nods to that effect. And also Grek is noticing that a few of the, the other kind of cities and a few of the other generals they're not hearing from uh so it seems to be some kind of at the moment they're thinking that it's some kind of like transmitter problem and there's also another character a uh, priest named uh ah foss, foss yep. yeah and so yes. he's kind of yeah. like the chaplain of the of the this group and the yes. the medical doctor he's examining <laughs> um someone who has shrapnel I, th- I think the soldier ended up dying but it's he's discovering that it's not bullets but it's it's uh really like meteor fragments mm, that are yeah. that are falling almost like uh shell like getting shelled yeah uh, yeah but it's not the traditional shrapnel that they're that they're used to it's like bits of stone we then kind of cut back to our president figure who uh has he's sort of sending out word to all the various military forces scattered um um uh, sort of throughout the planet to kind of come back to defend the capital city but he's not getting any response and then his office starts to shake and it kind of explodes uh, and uh, this is rather wonderful morbid line um because uh, he sends out a message but then kind of gets caught in a tunnel of flame and dies but yeah there's this line saying his children stare out from their watercolour world, innocent painted eyes, now spattered of the blood of their father. And that is, it, it's a terrific little scene. And you may be noticing, we haven't spoken much about the TARDIS. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we <laughs> Yeah. Now back on the TARDIS. <laughs> the Doctor and Benny have a conversation where Benny mentions, you know, they had just uh, gotten done with their big, although it's not mentioned, you know, the novel before this was with the master and yeah. there was a lot of stress and stuff going on. And Benny thinks, okay, I want to visit just a nice colony, have a little bit of a break. And she's, mm. she's thinking in her mind, oh, there's this, this one place called the 11th colony. And I want to uh, go there and, and see what, see what happened there. And she's, she's not remembering why she thought of it. Yeah. And while that's happening... She, she crucially... The, the, there's a moral lesson for us all here. She checks out the TARDIS library um, to find out more information. And, uh, and, and she finds in there a luminous hat box and a copy of the Moonstone, uh, but no information on the planet. So just, you need to make sure your archiving system is up to date, people, because otherwise the tragic scenes we were here in a novel could happen to you. Trouble lies ahead. Yes. <laughs> So uh, the doctor goes to find Ace, and you you get a couple of cool scenes within the TARDIS where he's wandering around and finds her um, on a beach looking out at the ocean. Yes, because the TARDIS has one of the great lakes inside it. <laughs> we we do get a a bit of that in uh, the journey to the center of the TARDIS. Where uh, yeah yeah we do we do <laughs> we're a, a beach in Wales, the same beach that uh, yeah journeys end and all the others happened on. Yeah, yep. so maybe it's the same beat. It sounds a bit warmer in the book than uh, than Wales would be. But uh... they go to this colony, which is co- it's a human colony, and it's called mm. Massatorus. And this is the this is the same colony that that Benny was thinking of. But mm. but nearby is a planet called Petrucia, which is the mm. the planet where the this war with uh, the Ismech and the Kutch has been happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, and But, you know, the Doctor and Benny don't know anything about that war. They want to go uh, nip off to that planet to uh, mm. check out the ring system. Yeah. Uh, there's also one other little thing that I'd like to chuck in here, because this is a, a random thing that we spend a bit of time on. No obvious, immediately obvious reason. Mm-hmm. So the Doctor is spending some doing some work on reconfiguring the TARDIS exterior. Uh, and like it, there's been fluctuations in the chameleon circuit um, that's kind of caused them to lose like the whole stacked roof 
in the past. And now he thinks he will have the St. John's ambulance sign back on the front. And there's quite a bit of sort of, he, he's proud that it's come back. Uh, and there's something been interesting in, there's, in the most recent issue of Doctor Who magazine, Mark Gatiss um, was being interviewed. Then apparently uh, he, it was almost like on contractual negotiations for Victory of the Daleks the St. John's ambulance side had to be restored for the 11th Doctor's era, or otherwise he wouldn't write a script. Oh, wow. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, he's got a big thing about this. We spent about two to three pages discussing the St. John's ambulance side. Like, really? Is this the most interesting way we can spend this time? Yeah, him trying to retcon, like, why the exterior yeah. of the police box has changed, and mm, presumably yeah. by the uh, time of the eighth doctor tv movie the the badge falls off again yes and it it switches around so the doctor and benny uh leave ace on massa taurus and they decide to go to petrugia to to look Mm -hmm. at the ring system yeah and while they they land on the planet the the rings aren't quite at their most brilliant yet Mm -hmm. as they're walking through the jungle they didn't they don't realize it but they they kind of land in the middle between these two um armies almost in uh, no Man's Land. In Grand Doctor Who style. <laughs> yeah. Each of them being captured by, by the other side. Yes, yeah. When we next see the Doctor, he's tied to a post. He's trying to kind of put together his memories of how he's got to this situation. And uh, and he's kind of like, he's then kind of like put on a spit and he's sort of being kind of sort of slowly cooked by the flames. It's basically, it's the cover of the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, yeah, and we've got that. And, yeah. <laughs> And Benny's captured by the by the Kutch, but um, mm. she's rescued pretty quickly thereafter. She only meets them really briefly. Yeah, and they don't know if she's male or female, and uh, they're quite surprised that she can talk. Mm. Yep, you you get definitely get like a kind of Planet of the Apes kind of vibe when when she starts speaking. Yeah, yeah. The Doctor, meanwhile, uh, so Grek has kind of heard about um, the Doctor being captured. Uh, and and so he kind of, he, he's wanting to sort of exercise his scientific interest. And so he goes and has a, examined this hideous ape uh, that, that has been captured so that he could then maybe claim to have discovered it and get greater fame. Apparently, again, according to Doctor Who magazine, this was where Gatiss originally wanted the Doctor to make his first appearance in the book. Wow. Um, for you to have all of these kind of scenes about um, um, sort of people of Petrusia, and then the Doctor kind of, we see him having been captured, then we find out how he got there. I don't think that would have necessarily worked. I mean, I'm not going to say uh, yeah, whether this works, but uh, hmm. Hmm. Uh, Gatiss was talking about how editorial insisted that say, it be structured in a more kind of like linear way. But, uh, yeah. Interesting. Well, Greg started to encounter the Doctor. Yep, and he uh, narrowly avoids execution because I think Greg mm. was going to just kill him, mm. or, or at least some of the other other soldiers were going to. Yes, on the spits. And then Greg has a kind of a shock when he realizes that the Doctor can speak. Right. Uh, and uh, so, and then when Greg accuses the Doctor of being a freak, uh, the Doctor reminisces about knowing some Siamese twins and the odd hermaphrodite, a very odd hermaphrodite, in fact. Is that a reference to Alpha Centauri? Yeah, I was thinking that it must have been, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's obviously been the um, a Mark Gatiss uh, interest for a, a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and... The room suddenly kind of shakes at this point, and uh, the doctor then kind of protects Grek by tipping a table over him before the walls came in. So we get another one of these examples of the doctor having almost kind of like superhuman reflexes that mm. uh, the new adventures seem to like to do every now and again. He's kept under guard, but he's able to get out relatively easily. And they start taking him a bit more seriously. Yeah. And kind of when they learn about Benny, they reckon that she's been captured by the Kutch and saying that that makes her as good as dead. And uh, Greg doesn't want to send a rescue mission because. Um, with Armistice so close, he doesn't want his men to be killed over an animal. And it's also around about this point, we start seeing some appearances of an unnamed woman in a simple room with a golden cross and a jug of frozen water. And she's kind of in some kind of seminary thing. She'll be making appearances throughout, but just we just have to kind of plant that seed there. And she's described as having like, a shaved head and is kind of like a monk or an acolyte as yes. part of this institution. And through her, um, we'll kind of start to find out some of the um, some of the 
the people in the organization she's a member of. Benny, as you were kind of alluding to earlier, she gets re well, she gets captured uh, again by, but this time uh, by Grek's side. I think Ran was the one who saved. Yes, her. yeah, yeah. Ran, Ran rescues. He's he's quite a devout soldier and bangs on about his oath and the culture of racially inferior, which yeah. Mm. He's a charmer, and uh, he believes that the cuts breed like mammals. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, lovely. We also learned, though, that the cuts have put a tracking device on Benny. Mm. Foreshadowing. Hidden on her coat, and, and that seemed a little incongruous, I, th- I thought, with some of the other technology, but they did have, you know, long-range communications and stuff, so perhaps... It... It's convenient for the plot yeah. for later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so... The doctor escapes the room he's being held in and leaves the kind of, it's an underground bunker kind of attached yeah. to a, a trench like you were talking about earlier with, the, yeah. with yeah. the trench warfare. And so he misses Benny by really just a matter of minutes. Does he? Does he? Yeah, so they, yeah. He, he escapes and then she's, <laughs> she's brought into the, to the headquarters Okay. Yeah. 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 So they, they miss each other. There's there's a lot of that going on in this book. Yeah. They. Uh, oh God. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we also have at this point Ran. Um, so, <laughs> or Mr. Twitchy is Benny. In case you refer to him, he starts reflecting upon his past and reflecting upon that rarity in this book, a female character. Um, a lady called Testra, who is um, one of the nicest non whores he's met, and he's sort of he's reminiscing about how how nice she was for someone who wasn't a prostitute, and then she gets blown up. It's it's yeah, it's 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 rough. Apart from Benny and Ace and the the woman we alluded to earlier, there's no other mention really of any female characters in this entire book. So that's uh, no. something that uh, I, th- I think the the conversation in Empress of Mars recently where <laughs> Bill and the Empress, you know, have a conversation that may have been one of the first to, to pass the Beschel test <laughs> of, yes. of Mark's work. There, I mean, there was the scene in Unquiet Dead where uh, Gwyneth and Rose have a conversation about, you know, seeing planes and stuff in the future. But that was added later by RTD when the episode was running long. Mm. So yeah. Benny and Ran uh, arrive at the at the headquarters and... Uh, um, and Grek is going to use her as a bargaining chip for um, to make sure that the docs behaves himself. Mm-hmm. So he sends Benny on a mission. Yes. Yeah, so Grek decides to uh, to send Benny off on a uh, mission to to the capital, Porson. Uh, by I always mispronounce this word, dirigible. Yeah, yeah. Dirigible airship. Uh, dirigible. Benny compares the airships to uh, the the dirigibles to Silurian yes. airships, which um, she had encountered in. I want to say it was blood heat right yes yes yep. yes yeah i was gonna say blood tide but you're right it was blood heat uh so and so quite why she goes um because surely it would be easier of a bargain chip if she was actually there mm-hmm. i don't know uh but i mean it though it does lead to kind of um, some cool action sequences yeah uh, so the doctor meanwhile is in the temple and uh, he's uh, met foss uh, the um, the priest that we were speaking about earlier who uh, says to the doctor that you've come at last and turns out this is a bit of misdirection uh and sort of foss is wondering whether the the doctor has anything to do with this kind of old time legend of his uh, Foster's he's talking about this thing called the Kef. The other thing we should mention too is that this temple that the doctor finds himself in predates the rest of the war and everything so it's it's been there for some time yes it's where the dugout the trenches and the, the headquarters were kind of built around this so it, it's yeah. part of the structure but it's older than a lot of the other areas that were carved out for the war yeah yeah and also foss is amazed that um, the doctor knows how to light candles but isn't a priest <laughs> so yeah i mean he's very much the kind of elder eccentric figure that uh, particularly sylvester mccoy in the tv series would often kind of get paired again um uh, you do have some quite enjoyable scenes um sort of uh, between the two of them interesting philosophical conversations and yeah you know. yeah there's also a hint of binro um mm. from um rebo's approach yeah the rebo's approach here as well the doctor has also has a little route around his pockets and he finds a screwed up piece of paper that he took from kind of grex's uh, sort of part of the trenches and discovers poor sim's last message which is kef 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 Dun, dun, dun. Which is a reference to that ancient evil. Yeah, that, the ancient, yeah. yes, 
on my notes, sort of <laughs> various Apple devices, kept wanting to do this, this Keef. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> it would be been fun to have an ancient evil called Keef. That would be possibly more interesting um, uh, on the airship. Benny slightly upsets Lisa uh, by just basically being. And so Lisa uh, suspects Benny's a spy. And because he's nuts, he orders her to be kind of chucked out of the airship. Um, and we get sort of quite a kind of cool scene where they're basically got her hanging over the edge and the suit of the jungle underneath. And we should mention there are three airships total yes. that are in this group that's heading towards the capital city to, to see what's happened. Yeah. But yeah, he doesn't chuck her out the airlock or the, mm. or the door. They get distracted because they suddenly see a giant plume of smoke. Because uh, like, this is quite often the way that this book kind of works is that basically most chapters end on a cliffhanger. And most cliffhangers are kind of in Grand Doctor Who style quite easily got out of or sort of people suddenly get distracted by something shiny and forget to do the evil act that they're about to do um they suddenly think that the um that their capital has uh, has been destroyed which it has uh and uh, lisa still reckons that she's one of the cutch and uh, benny says it could be kind of another power like an off-world power and uh, lisa um thinks it's crazy to talk about some other planets when Benny mentions Masatoris, he's got no idea that Masatoris exists. And then Benny remembers why the colony of Masatoris, the 11th colony, is so famous. But she doesn't tell us. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's obviously there is a da 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 uh, kind of thing. At that point, the dirigibles get attacked by yeah. this looming massive uh, spaceship that's kind of hovering. <laughs> Um, that's black. They don't. We don't. Don't really get a good description of it, but it's uh, ever. Yeah, it's just a big, really, big, <laughs> yes, big cavernous spaceship, as as we later learn, and it starts attacking the dirigibles, and they try to ret- retreat. Is it Liso? Liso? He, yep, yeah. he orders the soldiers to stand their ground and basically to go down with the ship, and yeah, and unlike humans who uh the officers would would go down with the ship as well the ismich have this rule that the officers get saved so <laughs> so he heads up to the top of the dirigible where there's a uh mm. it's almost like a a glider uh like an emergency craft and there's uh brass rails that extend down uh, almost like a miniature uh, launching strip, mm. almost like a roller coaster to get this thing launched. He's going to uh, to escape and head back to the headquarters in that. Mm. And I think rather reluctantly, Benny's allowed to accompany him. <laughs> but before they can get into the the glider itself, it gets destroyed by some of the incoming fire from the spaceship. Yeah. And at that point, the it's it's a really dramatic scene where there's another uh, dirigible below, and mm. they have to uh, jump from one one to the other and uh, yeah miraculously survive um, <laughs> <laughs> it is a very good action scene i mean I, mark gatus has a reputation for not being particularly good at action sequences i think that's what he's pretty good at i i, I enjoyed it i thought it was well choreographed and uh, well paced and very easy to visualize and uh mm. fortunately the uh the other blimp that they jumped down to also has a kind of escape pod uh glider thing yes. so they're able to uh <laughs> and no one's used it yeah. yes <laughs> yes yeah we also have um sort of Foss sort of in the temple revealing that said uh, that they could have the kind of shrine in the temple has something called a kef stone uh, which is a kind of like a dull stone embedded at its top and the shrine activates a secret stairway in the floor you know as these things always do uh and uh, the doctor has to kind of hide in there um when ran rocks up because it's towards the end of a chapter we need a cliffhanger and uh, then when ran's kind of gone away uh foss forces the doctor out not saying where the stairs are lead the doctor though reckons because that these earthquakes that has been experienced are symptoms of a major problem mm-hmm. And he says that um, Petruja has days before it dies. Mm -hmm. Before he kind of gets shuttled away into the little uh, hidey hole, (laughs) he he leaves his hat, his uh, white fedora from his Mm. uh, linen suit, which goes through quite the trashing in this... uh, (laughs) <laughs> in this Doesn't novel yeah. yeah when the soldiers kind of come in to search the temple looking for the doctor they don't find him but i think one of the soldiers notices his hat in the corner after they leave the doctor emerges and um mm-hmm. is climbing over the shrine which is a you know sacrilegious blasphemous thing to do and 
yeah. he removes the Keth stone, and mm-hmm. as he's kind of reaching precariously and removing it, the soldiers rush back in, you know, having mm-hmm. waited outside for about five minutes, and, re- <laughs> yes. and recapture him. But he's able to... Uh, kind of palm the stone in his pocket mm. more on that later yeah and then as they go outside uh, to take him to kind of to grek Rand's men get hit by a hail of meteorites uh and and one of the younger soldiers who we spoke about press uh kind of goes to help um some of the wounded men and finds them covered in this kind of yellow ectoplasm which uh, snakes tendrils now, I was wondering whether this was slightly inspired by mustard gas. Mm. It has a slight, you know, again, you know, it feels very World War One. this. Yeah, his description certainly kind of evoke that, especially yeah. the color choice. And yeah, yeah, Pris uh, reckons that this yellow ectoplasm is the Kef. And then he's killed. Uh, and the kind of like the yellow absorbs his remains. Yeah, and kind of pulls it back underground. Yeah. So it's, it, at this point, it's this yellow mass is coming out every, of the cracks of the ground every so often it's not mm. uh, it's a growing threat but it's it's kind of in the background still at at this point yeah also we're having some more appearances of the woman um the this mysterious unnamed woman uh and uh, she has kind of been introduced to the second in command of her organization uh this um this uh, I was going to say gentleman, that's that's too kind a word for him. Uh, this guy called Pava de Hooch, um, who um, he's described as a swaddled pig in purple robes. Uh, it's also described quite often in the book as a dwarf, which I don't know whether we would actually use that in a modern book uh, these days. I don't know. Uh, but basically, think of him as your kind of typical, really revolting genre fiction Catholic priest. It is. It does introduce some. Yeah, that is a little problematic when you have the uh, the sinister dwarf henchman sort of yes. character. Yeah. Yeah. Setting that aside, it, it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can like problematic media. We could also dislike problematic <laughs> media or like certain aspects of it and and, and not others. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. He also gives her a box containing a lump, which is the tongue of Saint Anthony that he instructs her to wear with pride. Uh, you'd have thought that this would go somewhere. It doesn't. The tongue doesn't get mentioned again, I don't think. Uh, and he also runs his hand over a thigh because he's a sexist pig and unpleasant. And we and we get references that the woman has been is part of this order for some time, and mm. she's very committed and devoted to the the practices of the religion, which seems like a twisted version of christianity because you get a lot of references to crosses and mm. uh, saint anthony like a like a saint that whole structure well i, I would say it's specifically it's a twisted version of catholicism mm-hmm. you, you have kind of like a lot of self-adulation that's appearing um and we don't have any kind of like speaking in tongues but it kind of it feels very much kind of in in that vibe if, if you've seen the tv series preacher or, or the comic book series preach from which um the show is based it, it's it's that kind of level subtle too okay. <laughs> um, so that was not very we should mention too that all the people in the this church or cathedral are all human or hu- humanoid there's no yeah. there's no references to um them being like lizards or part of the this other story it's almost like its own thing happening separately mm. from the book yes 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 i think it's quite quite clear that yeah it, yeah it's, it's important to emphasize that it's it's it is not um yeah it's, it's not our people from Petrusia. Mm-hmm. the doctor's kind of has got round to show him where the tardis is and uh, we have this kind of bit of oh this is where you keep your equipment and surprised by the size of it and maconza and grek are trying to kind of sort of figure out what the best forward is is um because they're hearing all of these reports of the cities having fallen and they're trying to figure out how many men they can kind of get for uh, for a fight because they feel that um, that the cuts are pulling a fast one and uh, and that maybe there is some some big attack that's happening mm-hmm. kind of cool when when ran mm. goes inside the tardis and you he gets mm. not only the realization that this this mammal he's been speaking down to is actually much more technologically sophisticated yeah presumably smarter than he is um so he gets a bit of a humbling moment there but Mm. then he gets to see the the doctor takes off in the tardis and he uh yeah so he gets to see his planet from orbit which is cool Mm. and the doctor uh puts on a spacesuit 
and <laughs> decides to uh, go out into the rings to get a sample yeah. of, you know, yeah. to compare against uh, what was taken from the soldiers. Because his, his assumption is that the Keth stones are somehow related to the, the meteorites mm-hmm. because they're very similar to the what was taken from the soldier. As he's doing an EVA outside the TARDIS, he had mentioned to Rand that in case something goes wrong, he reprogrammed the TARDIS to kind of the fast return switch to, uh, without mentioning <laughs> it, uh, yeah. take him back to where they had taken off from in, in case mm. something goes wrong and something does go wrong we mm. doctor gets hit by an asteroid fragment and kind of goes because floating off into space uh and he then starts remembering fort of doomsday uh and the abankans <laughs> and then he gets caught in a tractor beam from the giant spaceship also it's probably worth saying round about this point that um grek and his crew suddenly they are actually attacked by the Kutch because uh, the the leader of the Kutch, this guy called Imelhite, uh, who was tracking Benny, has figured out where the base is and he successfully invades the trenches. And uh, dear old Doctor McConza gets shot dead, which doesn't come as a great surprise because it kind of felt that it's something that his character, yeah, would happen to his character in a World War One storyline. Uh, and uh, yeah, so Grek uh, uh, is kind of captured by Imalgahite, who's getting somewhat gloaty, um, and the fact that uh, yeah, the the Kutch appear to have won, and then Grek says that reveals what's been happening with their cities and. It turns out that um, the Kutch cities have been disappearing as well, and they've been having transmitter issues. So uh, Imalgahite is kind of reckoning that uh, it's possibly a trick, and which is, doesn't seem totally unreasonable. Uh, Foss runs out of the temple due to kind of earthquakes and, and stuff, and Foss doesn't appear to be particularly well hinged at the best of times, but uh, he, he, does, he, he does freak out a bit when he sees the ooze pouring over the edge of the trench, because he reckons that in the ooze he has seen the face of General Hoff, uh, who was one of the generals that they were hoping to hear from earlier. He's also ranting about the Keth, and he's now being captured by, by, by the Kutch. Then Imalgahite uh, has kind of got his men to do a little bit of kind of investigations, and uh, he brings evidence of a head covered in some kind of gelatinous material, and uh, it's the head of Makonza. He's been attacked uh, by the ooze. And the description it says several vertebrae dribbled slackly from below the head. Lovely. There's a few moments in this uh, in this story where it does get a little graphic, and um... yeah, we won't go into too much of the the, the kind of the graphic detail, but uh, but that gives you a flavour of uh, some of the, the lovely stuff, and that's nothing comparison to some things that's come. <laughs> oh dear right okay speaking of we cut back to uh the cathedral or or the the woman forgets some of her uh i guess their vows or um part of a prayer that she's supposed to be able to recite and this creates a lot of anger in what's his well papa the hooch yep the hooch creates a a lot of anger in him and and he wants to uh i think have her tongue cut out for for getting graphic punishment uh and the hooch kind of goes off to go and have a conversation with the guy who's in charge this Mango William Hon Wen Yong, uh, who is described as a beautiful 35 year old uh, Chinese in purple robes. <laughs> Not a Chinese man or anything. It's like, oh, okay. Uh, and uh, he's busy torturing a kitten because the kitten is refusing to acknowledge the will of Sir Anthony. He's that kind of guy. Also, yeah, at this point, the woman has managed to escape. Uh, and uh, De Hooch uh, says that the woman's escaped and uh, Yong seems a little bit perturbed by this and then gets back to killing the kitten. And I don't know whether this scene's supposed to be funny or anything. Um, I mean, I think they're supposed to be comic grotesque, but I just just find it vile. It reminded me a lot of, um, like in the Dune series, like Baron Harkonnen, that sort of just twisted uh, torture just to show like how evil and depraved the vi- the villain they're up against sort of is. Yeah. It was, I'm a cat person, so I did not enjoy yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> Enjoy yeah. that at all. So the woman's on the run, and she kind of goes down some stone corridors, and then 
mysteriously finds herself in an area with the legend goggles must be worn and uh, she then is in a kind of a chamber with banks of circuitry so what is going on she goes into the room right she she puts the goggles on yeah. and realizes that the uh that bright light is is actually the light of an artificial sun mm. so you get the realization that this seminary isn't on a planet mm. somewhere or if it is it's deep underground or mm. it's could be a part of a spaceship it's not it's not the vatican yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah. benny and lisa meanwhile they're in the escape copter being chased by the remorseless black ship and uh, lisa lands the copter um where the tardis had been parked uh, and uh, kind of Lisa is also having a bit of an existential crisis because he realizes that the Kutch weren't the real enemy after all. It was the Kef. Benny's despondent. Then she realizes that the you know, the Tardis is returning. And uh, but when Tardis materializes, it's Ran, which makes her despondent again. Ran and Lisa think that they've got no chance against the Kef. And uh, then Benny has this great line of um, she thinks she's you know, more optimistic, and uh, and she says. Well, I don't know how many mythical bogeymen have to do their chain rattling in spaceship. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that sounds like Benny. Yeah. Uh, Mark Gates has a good grasp of Benny here. It uh, does, does feel like Benny. I'm not entirely sure to what extent this the Doctor feels like the seventh Doctor. Certainly kind of Benny gets to say witty things and sort of and be be strong and just just generally be Benny. The the biggest difference in characterization for the seventh doctor for me was that in this story he's very reactive to everything. Oh, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, in in a lot of stories he kind of has extra knowledge about what's going on or mm. in in this case he does a little bit but not for, for the entire story and, and uh. it's not something where he's setting up chess pieces. It's not that sort of no. seventh doctor no 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 very much not very much not should mention too that uh at this point we kind of realize that there are two black ships because there's the one that's pursuing benny above the jungle and the dirigible before they land but then there's also the the black ship in orbit that scooped up the doctor in in the tractor beam because because you're, you're getting the scenes intercut so it, it's, it was around this time that i realized hey we have we have more than one ship here yeah yeah so yeah, so the doctor he's landed on that that back black ship in orbit, uh, and he's in an enormous hangar, and finds his way onto the metal corridors. So he gets quite excited about about prospect of running down corridors, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, he's also got a white tablet in his trousers before me analysis. I was like, really? Does does he often have that? I don't know. It's like he's got like a like a smartphone down there or something. I think he had brought that in in his spacesuit as part of the analysis of the meteorite yeah i mean it'd be a useful thing for him to have on a more regular basis but sometimes it reminded me of a little tricorder yes 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 doesn't it just and now he just has a sonic screwdriver for that yes because he... complete with readouts yes because in, in those in these days um uh, the seventh doctor no sonic screwdriver um apart from the tv booth the woman, she's come across this ritual of a load of kind of caged penitents being trundled across flagstones in this big cathedral. And Yong is uh, uh, preaching about the heathens, saying uh, if they convert, they can be spared. And there's a, a young girl who is um, is asked whether she knows how depraved she is. And uh, when she says um, that she isn't depraved, um, she gets stabbed with a spear and then thrown into a column of fire along with um, the rest of uh, her captives. Lovely. And uh, De Hooch arrives uh, with a prisoner. Um, so the doctor is found snooping around. And then the doctor sees the woman. And the woman is Ace! <gasps> Surprise! Yeah. How surprised were you by that? I have figured it out beforehand. And I... Yeah. <laughs> not a whole lot before, but I... In chapter 11, which I think was one or two chapters before the reveal where she starts realizing that she had suppressed memories. Yeah. That's where that's what it kind of keyed to me. I was like, oh, maybe Ace isn't taking a Nissa nap this whole uh, novel <laughs> yeah. and she's actually in it. So yeah, yeah, it was Ace the whole time. And I kind of pictured uh, Natalie Portman's character from V for Vendetta mm. in terms of kind of how Ace was, or at least 
before I figured out it was Ace, that, that was kind of the, yeah. the figure in my mind that I was yeah. putting in there. So yeah, so it turns out it was uh, Ace who was uh, aboard this. And so the cathedral and everything that we thought was perhaps on a planet or somewhere else uh, is all contained within this massive ship. And it's part of a cult that uh, Magna Yang has been mm. uh, running. He's the second in the line and it, it got kind of a uh, North Korea Kim Jong-un kind of <laughs> vibe from him <laughs> where yeah. his fa- father did the same thing and yeah. they, they basically go from planet to planet and mm. either eradicate everyone with St. Anthony's Fire, which is a giant phaser, laser, Death Star sort of yes. thing yeah. that incinerates people, which is what incinerated those uh, the, the people they had picked up, which were the last surviving human colonists from uh, Matrosis, where uh, Ace had been dropped off. Yeah. Very few of them that they pick up, they end up converting to become acolytes and brainwash them. Yeah. And that's the process that Ace went through, um, but she was able to to fight off that conditioning, or at least start to break through it. Yeah, it, it's somewhat Cyberman style in a way. One of the little bits of, uh, in, in this kind of series of reveals as to kind of what the deal is with with these people is uh, Young said that the um, that the chapter is a breakaway movement after all of the faiths were forced to merge in the mid twenty first century, and so these Catholic extremists decided to go into space. Yeah, I was like. Oh, okay. Like the papal mainframe. Well, yes. Yeah, I was wondering to what extent, you know, whether there was any DNA of this in the papal mainframe. But uh, um, I don't know. The papal mainframe people seem to be more reasonable, mm, mm-hmm. <laughs> or at least more tea time friendly. Yeah. Yeah. So Ran is kind of running through the jungle uh, with a wooden box that will become um, somewhat important later. So just, just, uh, and you may hear the sigh in my voice. Just, just remember, Ran's got a box. Um, mm-hmm. This is going to become important. Uh, and uh, and Yong is kind of he, he's kind of all ranting at the doctor, and he, he's basically getting all kind of full on nothing in the world can stop me now um and uh, to kind of uh, to quote um professor zaroff yes professor zaroff yes yeah uh and also in this scene where the doctor is being to young the hooch emerges from underneath young's purple robes have they been doing something or else? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> oh i missed that part <laughs> So uh, yeah, and the ship's coming to land. So kind of Young wants to blow up more of the rings on route of this planet that he yeah admits he doesn't even know the name of. And then when they land, there's uh, two guards that are already on duty, and they give him a briefing as to how burdened the world is. And they say there's a highly developed culture. Not really. It's lizard people doing one or one. And Young tells them to get rid of it all uh, because he's evil. Part. I mean, of course, they were bombarding, you know, the planet with some of the mm. the ring fragments. They were kind of causing that. But his idea to get rid of it all is to uh, burn down the jungle. And he he dispatches three yeah. guards with uh, blowtorch backpacks. And I just thought that was it was it seemed very symbolic because I mean, there's no way you're going to destroy an entire jungle planet you know, with just three people, but I think he just wanted to lay waste, you know, apart from the cities that they had already destroyed, this was one of the major, um, groups of life forms that they found on the planet, which is why they landed both, uh, the smaller scout ship and then the larger, Mm -hmm. um, kind of cathedral ship side by side. So both, both ships kind of land in this no man zone between the two warring sides. Yeah. We should should mention too, we get the, we get a detail that the planet that Ace had is, mm-hmm. had been left on is the is in the same solar system as this planet. So it's like planets three and four in the yeah. in the same system. So that that was an interesting detail. I thought we get another curious detail. Um, that sort of one of the guards or one of the guys is kind of going around setting fire to everything. Um, fondly reminisces about destroying the ancient city of Euros Disney. So which is Euro Disney. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> right, okay, fine, whatever. Also, um, there's like a throwaway line that the guards have translators, which uh, it's, uh, I only picked that up on kind of like a second read when I was doing, doing my notes, because I was kind of going, how are they all understanding each other? Grek um, and, uh, and Amalgahite have decided to kind of work together. And they and Benny... Um, sort of arrive on the ships, trying to pledge allegiance um, to um, to the Kef, 
And uh, Benny pretends that she was found as a child by the lizards and she's been kind of raised almost like Mowgli in the the Jungle Book. And the guards decide to go, oh, yeah, we'll let you on the ship. Yeah, go on. And whilst that's happening, the Doctor, Ace and Foss uh, sneak off the other ship. Um, uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah, Foss has been captured and De Hooch at one point gets thrown in a cupboard by Ace, kind of run like Hitler does in Let's Kill Hitler. Um, we are going to have a lot of running around and people capturing each other and then getting uncaptured. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's kind of like a Pertwee run around, but with less of the charm. Yeah. When all this is happening, the ooze that we heard about from earlier uh, keeps progressing and starts... Uh picking off the uh, blowtorch soldiers kind of one by one and sucks them into the uh, yeah. the mass. And it's growing and becoming this kind of amorphous blob on the surface of the mm. of the planet. We also find out around about here that Yong has in his quarters a stuffed gorilla that he uses as a communication device. <laughs> and an, uh, an eyeball and an, a lid that he keeps in a box on his throne to randomly stroke when he wants to uh, touch his own eye but doesn't want to touch his eye. So that's <laughs> yes, <really> weird. Yeah. <laughs> Quite the, uh, he bathes in yeah, giraffe's milk. Yeah, He's yeah. Uh, Tiger bone tea, so which is the last remnants of the tigers of Earth. Uh, yeah, yeah, Young's a nice guy. So Ace and Foss and the Doctor get back to the temple uh, where the Doctor sort of says that the rings aren't real and it's all a construct. And uh, they kind of descend the steps and they find underneath the temple a polygon kind of like from ancient times. Kind of in a nod to what we had on Earth with the Silurians, uh, Mm. but in reverse. So the ancient race on this planet was the mammals and the the reptiles were the later. uh, So that was kind of a cool revelation that uh, this previous uh, species on the planet was Mm. uh, mammalian. And and that you kind of get an info dump at that point as to what happened on the planet and that... uh, these rings were these artificial rings were created as a almost like a network to contain amorphous uh, blob that's on the yeah. the planet to keep it from infecting the rest of the galaxy. And, and so it's like a prison. Doctor watches. He's told all of this by a video of Nerid from the prologue, um, and so I just kind of it felt very Princess Leia. Um, <laughs> this bit, but. Uh, yeah, uh, so so we're also having quite a bit of action kind of like up on the ship uh, as um, uh, Benny, Benny's captured, Benny escapes, Benny's captured, Benny punches Hooch. Uh, <laughs> Breaks his nose. There's a coup attempt yeah, and then another um, coup attempt. Hooch seems to be telling everybody um, that will listen that, uh, that he's going to kind of, yeah, that, that he'll be in charge. It's, he's telling people that he shouldn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Ran is placing that mysterious box of his between two panels of instrumentation in the um, in, in the spaceships. So, in the sunroom, where there's lots of extra heat. Yeah, so what is he doing? Uh, the mm-hmm. Doctor and Ace kind of go aboard Benny's spaceship. Which is the smaller scout ship. And at that point, they devise a plan to really, to, to try and wrap it up. <laughs> yes, they, uh, yeah. they... <laughs> there's lots more capturing and stuff that we're not going into because yeah gosh yes so much padding but um the plan is basically to the reason the the blob is getting so much stronger the keth i guess is or the keth was the mammal species right No, the keth is it's never actually made terribly clear i i in my mind i think yeah. that the keth is the kind of the name for the, the you know the, the ooze the blob okay the rings that were disrupted that created the meteors that uh, mm. rained down on the planet, that was part of the network, the safety field that was keeping this thing contained. So the doctor's plan is to replace the energy that was lost in the field with um, really is the ship's cores um, on both of both the scout ship and the, the main ship. And his thought is that between the two of them, if they do it at just the right time, it would release enough energy into the mm. network of rings to um, cause the planet to, which is going to explode anyway in, the, in a couple of days, but it would... It would do it in such a way to contain the creature so it's not scattered across the galaxy and can infect other worlds, but instead uh, would be contained within the explosion of the planet and, and destroyed. Yeah. Uh, so that's the plan. And the, and what they're trying to do is to get both ships into orbit w- in the ring system to make that happen. Benny's given special allowance to go with Ran to kind of go from city 
to city or, or village to village to try and collect as many survivors as they can mm. um, before this happens. Because even though you have, you know, the three or four main cities, you still have survivors on the outskirts. So they're they're trying, yeah. they're given a couple of hours to go do that while some of all this other escaping and <sighs> yeah. capturing and escaping happens. And then we get kind of the, the, the big final moment where the earlier uh, leader, uh, Yang, he's... Uh, on, has escaped the i guess the final time and he's yeah. he's running through and trying to disrupt uh the the doc, the navigation systems from getting into place and there's this whole convoluted thing where half the controls are on the bridge and half are in the control room where we saw the incineration of the uh human colonist survivors earlier here's the thing as well like so you've got the directional equipment in the cathedral nobody seems fit to mention this so you don't have anybody like in it it, it just seems to be people just run from room to room it would make sense for there to be a group of people kind of having secured one room and a group of people having secured the other room it seems like yong seems to be the only person that knows how how the ship works which seems bizarre yeah and yang really brought all this upon himself too because he when the doctor was first brought out on the ship he said you know i like a challenge i haven't been challenged in a while yeah. doctor i'm going to give you free reign of my ship do whatever you yeah, want yeah. we also ran about this song get a flashback to um to de hooch's youth in um in the new dutch republic now a few of the new adventures had um the good people from netherlands having to flee due to rising tides and in this book, um, apparently, the Dutch settle in land formed in the, in the Atlantic following seismic shifts. And uh, yeah, uh, so there you go. If you're, if you're Dutch, this is the future that Doctor Who predicts for you. <laughs> and also we find out that um, De Hooch got captured by the chapter when he was en route to Titan. So it's uh, a reference to last month's book, or not a reference. So, so it's the same setting but it's, uh... plus all the rings made me think of it yeah. too um, we now have kind of young's dead then he kind of he manages to kill the hooch cracking the dwarf's head like a rotten egg as it says and it's <laughs> lovely by bringing down a crucifix <laughs> Yes, yes, yeah, and it man they managed to get the flames to kind of go, and uh, and sort of Yong is kind of burnt by the flame. However, the flames in the wrong direction, so um, so Grack has to kind of run into the cathedral and kind of get the directional stuff right, and then and but alas, he too burns. That did kind of feel like a natural end to his character, probably where it was. Yeah, that was it was he was always likely to um, to die. Um, both the doctor and, and and kind of Benny independently um, set up things to kind of kill the remaining um, sort of St. Anthony's people. The big cathedral ship is uh, yeah, has now been taken over by some by the lunatic fringe of the lunatics. Uh, and so uh, the doctor puts the artificial sun into irreversible decline, and uh, and Benny's managed to program the ship to go into Petrusha's orbit, and uh, basically it just gets vaporized uh, when the planet explodes. An interesting thing, the the doctor he was going to save them and say, "You've got enough energy to make landfall, you know, somewhere, yeah. so you can you can escape." And Benny, without telling the doctor, remotely piloted the ship into uh, into the into the planet. Yeah. So the doctor thinks thinks they escaped, and and Benny and Ace kind of knowingly between the two of them exchange a, a moment where uh, they know that's not what happened. So uh, you'd be delighted to hear that the story's nearly over. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> we we cut to uh, to Masatorus, which is now being repopulated with uh, protrusions and the recovering converts, and we get the reveal that Rand's magic box that was all important contains the eggs of his future children. Uh, also, at one point, it distracted Yong. Yong got distracted by the box and, uh, and then got shot and then didn't die. Anyway, so, yeah, <laughs> yeah, ridiculous. Um, so Benny explains the legend she'd heard about Masatoris was that the colony had disappeared and that another race was found to be living there sometime later that everyone was assumed was an invasion force. Uh, and uh, so she thought that the Petrusians were going to attack Massatorus. It makes me, I've got two questions. Like, because there's some recovering converts as well. Wouldn't they be able to put the record straight? And also, this doesn't sound like the kind of misunderstanding that would be resolved peacefully. <laughs> so like, if the people kind of like of the human empire or whatever kind of come back and sort of like, oh, oh, you're now in terms of this colony. What happened to all the humans? Um, this doesn't sound like it would be sorted out over a cup of tea. 
seems like a potentially a kind of a grim ending, but uh, everyone now just goes on their way and sort of yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. What a joy that was. So that's St. Anthony's Fire. Do you want to go first? <laughs> I was like, my opinion is probably quite clear. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, overall, I I wasn't... Hmm. I, I did, like like I mentioned, kind of as we were talking through the, the plot summary, there were parts of this that I did find somewhat problematic, um, especially mm-hmm. looking at it, you know, with a 2017 lens. Given, you know, the time it was written in and I, kind of middle of the road for me, I... There were there were parts of this I, I really enjoyed. One thing that did come to mind was a a quote from Russell T Davies when he was bringing back the new series, and he mm. one of the reasons why he said he didn't set things on alien planets is because no one cares about aliens from the planet Zog, and and you you know <laughs> to tie it to Earth in some some respect. I did like what Gatiss did with uh, the cultures and the and the war and stuff, but a lot of it was in a weird way kind of telegraphing mm. bits of stories that he would use you know later on in. in knew who so so there's that layer added onto it too so i found it kind of hard to uh Mm. judge this on its own as a story what were your kind of opinion about it i think it feels like it's it probably been better as a novella because like we don't get an enormous amount of stuff about Mm. the kind of the culture of um of the petrusians apart from the fact that they're in a big old war um i mean i would have loved to find out some more about the kind of the culture but so uh, yeah we, we we just have very small hints yeah these did just feel like blokes in lizard suits um and th- there's no there's not much about their biology that's kind of different or, or about their society having some female soldiers that would have just helped a little bit or some other yeah there's various various things that could have been done just to make things a bit more imaginative and i just actively no interest in the scenes featuring the chapter of saint anthony i found those just appalling people doing appalling things and but religions and cults uh, because this this is very much a cult in this um are often they're a lot more interesting when you can see what the appeal would be and and sort of they would become more credible kind of mm-hmm. yeah villains or presences in the story that way. Uh, whereas with this, I mean, they're just clearly crazy. Yeah. I, I I couldn't yeah I, I, uh, yeah it, it was it was it was just bad. Uh, and there's so much running around and getting captured and and it's yeah. Mm. I had thought I had read this before, but this is where I had stopped. Back in the late 90s, like, I think it was early 2000s even, decided to try and read all the new adventures in order. (laughs) I got through, or I got up to St. Anthony's Fire, and I never started this one. And I think it was just because right around that same time, the show had come back, and then I stepped away from it and and never picked it up. But um, yeah, I don't know, had I read this one, if I would have gotten much farther. This one, and then I think Falls of the Shadows, the next one, which I haven't read, but it has also a kind of a bad reputation, so. Without wishing to go to spoilers, I will, uh, on my reaction, I mean, I, I will. I, I remember having issues with both, but enjoying Force of Shadow more. Hmm. That's yeah, very different issues. But yeah, for for Saint Anthony's Fire, I definitely the first half was mm. better or felt better than the than reading the second half. Yeah. yeah. In terms of how we would rate this one, I think I would give it a six out of ten. Huh. Um, there were elements I liked. It, I would have appreciated more, you know, Doctor Benny and Ace. They they didn't seem like they were in the story a whole lot. Um, I didn't. I think I enjoyed the parts with Benny the most. Mm, yeah. Um, in, in terms of the three main characters, yeah, it just uh, it wasn't. It just didn't all come together for me. I mm, guess. Yeah. In, yeah. in that way, and it, and it felt a little padded with all the runarounds and capturing and recapturing. So yeah. the, the gem of a story is there, but I, I totally agree with you. I think it may have worked better as a novella. I mean, for me, I just, 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 just found it. I mean, it wasn't terrible, but uh, yeah, it's a free. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, right. I was thinking of giving it a four and then I've just kind of, I've, I've just thought my, I a six and a three. I don't know if we. I don't think we've had a, a, as big a divergence. <laughs> oh no, no, we did. We did have a four and a seven. Yeah, yeah. But... With a big bang generation. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And in both cases, hmm. the person who um, gave it the the lowest score was the one who chose it. 
yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. dude. Gosh. Yeah. Well, um, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, we do have a uh, hope. I think next month will be a little bit more interesting and different. We'll get to yes. that in a second. Yes, yes. Shall we cleanse our palate with some mail? <laughs> yes. Let's see. Uh, we ran a Twitter poll. Mm hmm. We asked uh, of the first four books we had done, mm. what has been uh, listeners' favorites? Mm. And it could have been favorite book if they had read it along with us, or perhaps more likely which of the four podcasts they mm. enjoyed the story of the most. Yeah. Um, and Engines of War got 45%, okay. which was the highest score. Mm. Big Bang Generation got 18%. Mm. Silent Stars Go By got 9%, which mm. surprised me a little bit. Mm. And then Face of the Enemy got 28%. So okay. it, was, it was kind of interesting to, yeah, to get that yeah, feedback. Yeah. It's, it's, it's... Um, we did get an email. Let me find it here. Thomas, mm -hmm. who says, uh, I'm a fan of the podcast and it's very insightful. Keep up the great work. And then he uh, lists, he says, I have some suggestions if you'll take them. Mm -hmm. And he lists uh, four books that we, he would like us to review. I'm not going to reveal the titles. Right. I will say to Thomas that one of the four books he picked is on my short list for uh november so Ooh, okay unless some something big happens and some yeah. new doctor who books gets published or something uh <laughs> thomas one of your four suggestions is is what i'm going to pick for uh november's reading mm. so stay tuned for that but before that we have uh september next month mm. and we're going to change it up quite a bit <laughs> Up until this point, uh, we've only read novels. We're going to kind of expand the remit a little bit. And for the first time, we're going to do a anthology book. And there were quite a few different ranges to choose from. Virgin Publishing did a series of five uh, books called Decalogue. BBC Books did three called Short Trips. And then Big Finish did uh, something like 30 Short Trips <laughs> books. And then um, there's been some done by uh, publishers since, like uh, Penguin has done like 12 Doctors, 12 Stories. But I decided to go with was uh, Short Trips, the original uh, Short Trips, the BBC Books version from... Um, 98. 98. 98, yeah. yeah. So that'll be uh, interesting. There's 16 stories in that collection mm. total, and it, it'll be a little bit different format i think podcast wise where we might tackle it lightning round style yeah. where we would do uh quick recaps and reactions for each story yeah. and then at the end give a numerical ranking to the entire collection mm -hmm. so something new and different mm. next time yeah yeah no I'm, I'm i'm looking forward i i have skipped ahead and i i i've read the first story of, of one of Ooh. yeah so and it, it was a nice quick read yeah should be should be fun should be fun uh certainly i'm uh, looking forward to reading about something that isn't evil uh, religious folk doing horrible things to kittens uh. <laughs> yeah um <laughs> Do you want to <laughs> apologize? Yes. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Do you want to uh, talk a little bit about the Facebook page? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so uh, yeah. So I've I've uh, set up a, um, a a Facebook page. Um, yeah. I've I've done it as a kind of uh, as a page of the podcast. Um, uh, if people are interested, then I'm happy to kind of like convert it into a kind of community group along the lines of kind of. Like the, the TARDIS Tavern, amongst others. Uh, yeah, so do do feel free to kind of put any comments on there. Uh, the, there's a sort of a post for each of the episodes. Uh, so if you've got any kind of thoughts on the book, uh, also any thoughts on the show. And uh, also, please, 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 please go along to iTunes and, uh, and put a review because uh, uh, that does help uh, the algorithm. It does, yeah. If we can get, uh, I think, Two or three more reviews will start showing up higher in the uh, search results, and mm. that'll help us out a lot. And it just takes a minute or two for you to, if you open up your app and mm. go ahead and give us a rating. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, exciting stuff. Yes. And until next time, I've been Matt in Minnesota. And I've been a very penitent Chris in South London. <laughs> Happy reading. <laughs>for listening to the all-new adventures of the doctor who book club podcast you can contact the show and follow us on twitter at andwbc podcast our music is the doctor who theme swing jazz version by george c music used with attribution under creative commons license until next month happy reading
have you seen Spider-Man Homecoming yet? I have. Yes. So we, we, we are not long back from that. That was rather good. I enjoyed it. I really liked it. Did you stick to the end for the final kind of post credit scene? Uh, yeah, the Captain America one. Yes, yes, yes. Which is a, a lovely nod to uh, Ferris Bueller. I haven't seen the two Andrew Garfield ones yet. The first Garfield possibly is my favourite Spider-Man movie, but... Uh, as we might discover during the course of uh, this podcast, my tastes don't necessarily align with the masses. <laughs> <laughs> but the second Garfield is rubbish. Mm-hmm.